Welcome to Pathology Central Key Concepts. The topic of this video is fetal hydrops. And in this video, I'll be describing the etiology, pathophysiology, and clinical consequences of the two types of fetal hydrops, immune and non-immune. So what is fetal hydrops? It's the accumulation of edema fluid in the fetus during intrauterine growth. It's typically identified prenatally through ultrasound, uh, there are a variety of different findings. I've put in red the four findings that are most significant and that if two of these findings are seen uh, on ultrasound, it's diagnostic of fetal hydrops. And these are ascites, pleural effusions, pericardial effusions, and skin edema. You can also see polyhydramnius uh, and placental thickening. Clinically, uh, the uterus may uh, appear large for dates. Now I have a trigger here. This is just in case you're watching this with friends and family uh, so that they can avert their eyes because this is, uh, in fact, uh, an intrauterine fetal, fetal demise uh, due to uh, fetal hydrops. It's one of the things that we see here is this uh, generalized edema. So we see the abdomen is swollen. Uh, we see fluid here in the neck, uh, and then the head is also uh, edematous. Now, one thing to recognize is that uh, the uh, hydrops that we see exists on a spectrum. So this is uh, in an intrauterine fetal demise. Uh, we may see uh, edema fluid, for example, in the context of Turner syndrome uh, with a cystic hygroma, uh, which will result later on in the webbed neck that is characteristic of Turner syndrome. So as I mentioned, there are two types of fetal hydrops. We have immune hydrops, which is a hemolytic disease caused by blood antigen incompatibility between the mother and the fetus. And then we have non-immune hydrops, which is basically due to an imbalance between interstitial fluid production and lymphatic return. And there are a variety of different causes of this, which we'll go through one by one. Here are a couple of examples. You can see this due to lymphatic obstruction of the thorax and abdomen, which we can see in aneuploidy. Uh, or you can see uh, this due to increased central venous pressure, which is due to cardiac failure. Often it's a combination of these two. Let's begin by focusing on immune hydrops. So in this scenario, what we see is we have immunization of the mother by blood group antigens on fetal red cells. And this can happen during the third trimester when cytotrophoblasts no, no longer acts as an impermeable barrier to fetal red cells entering uh, the maternal circulation. Uh, it can happen during birth. It can happen during an abortion. Uh, what happens then is that when the, the mother has been inoculated with these red cells, she will develop an immune response. Now, typically, this is not going to happen during that first pregnancy, uh, but subsequent pregnancies uh, with, uh, and we're going to focus uh, first on RH incompatibility. If you have RH incompatibility in a subsequent pregnancy, then you can get fetal hydrops. Because what happens then is initially what's formed is IgM antibodies, which are too large to pass through the placenta, which is why that first uh, pregnancy is not affected. Uh, but in the subsequent pregnancies, IgG is small enough so it can pass through the placenta. It's going to destroy the fetal red cells, which is going to lead to anemia. It's going to cause jaundice because as those red cells lyse, they're going to release uh, bilirubin uh, into uh, the circulation. Bilirubin can accumulate uh, in the fetal brain, leading to carnicterus, uh, which is a yellow discoloration of the, uh, of the brain tissue. I'll show you in a moment. And this can have uh, multiple effects, such as intellectual disability, cerebral palsy, vision disturbances. Now, you can end up with hypoxic heart injury because with the lysis of red cells, there's no longer sufficient oxygen, oxygenation of the cardiac tissue. So this can lead to cardiac failure. You can also get cardiac failure because the heart begins beating very rapidly, so high output cardiac failure as it's trying to push the residual red cells through and oxygenate the body. When you get cardiac failure, you're going to have increased hydrostatic pressure as you get uh, backup of uh, fluid. So the lungs uh, will uh, become edematous, and then you will end up with, because of the leakiness that we see in fetal capillaries, uh, as well as other issues, the general looseness of fetal tissues, uh, edema can result. When you have uh, significant uh, anemia, you can also end up with hypoxic liver injury. And one of the consequences of this is that the liver is no longer able to synthesize proteins such as albumin. This is going to lead to decreased oncotic pressure. So as you'll recall from your, uh, your earlier studies uh, of circulatory dysfunction and how edema uh, builds up, with increased hydrostatic pressure, decreased oncotic pressure, you have a setup for edema. 
Let's take a look at some of the findings. Here you can see a fetal brain uh, with yellow discoloration here in the basal ganglia. It's a subtle finding. I, I will grant you that, but you can see it uh, here. One of the uh, other uh, consequences of significant hemolysis is that the fetus will be trying to generate as many red cells as possible. Uh, and so here we have an example of extramedullary hematopoiesis uh, in the liver. So these are all little erythroblasts that are uh, frantically trying to, uh, to be generated. Uh, this can lead to hepatomegaly, to splenomegaly. So these are additional findings we can see in fetal hydrops. So let's go through uh, RH incompatibility. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, it's not as common in higher resource countries because we have uh, prophylaxis, but this was the first one and it used to be the major cause of uh, fetal hydrops. So it's worth focusing on so we can understand the pathophysiology of this disease. So as you'll recall, there are multiple RH antigens uh, of them. The D antigen is the one that is the primary uh, cause of incompatibility between the mother and fetus. Uh, and you have the option of having a, po having a plus allele or a negative. If you have, are positive for this allele, you will have this transmembrane RH protein uh, here uh, on your red cells. And if you are negative, uh, then you don't have that protein. So if we begin here uh, with a fetus that is RH positive, those RH uh, positive uh, red cells uh, are going to uh, come through the placenta, either through the cytotrophoblast or you can have this uh, during, uh, during birth, which are going to stimulate antibody production against the RH antigen in the maternal circulation. Now at that first inoculation, uh, we're going to get uh, IgM uh, that is formed. Uh, subsequently, we move on to IgG. Uh, and this uh, IgG can cross the placenta. It's going to attach to the fetal erythrocytes and destroy them, right? So this is a basic process of immunology. Uh, you have uh, the antibodies recognizing the foreign uh, protein uh, and subsequent destruction. So this is going to lead us down two pathways. One is going to be uh, anemia uh, and the extramedullary hematopoiesis that I uh, demonstrated in the previous slide. Uh, and then cardiac decompensation, uh, either because of high output failure or uh, damage to the uh, heart to, uh, due to hypoxia. And this is going to lead to uh, high drops. We also see a, a second manifestation, uh, which is hemoglobin degradation, leading to increased bilirubin uh, in the blood. Uh, so uh, when you have an intrauterine fetal demise or due to fetal high drops, you'll often see that the infant is jaundiced. Uh, and then uh, at autopsy, you can see carnicterus, as I showed in the previous slide. Now, there are some uh, things to think about when you think about RH incompatibility that sort of modulate uh, the picture I just described. So if you have ABO incompatibility between the mother and the fetus, this is going to protect the mother against RH immunization because as fetal red cells are introduced into her circulation, her uh, antibodies are going to bind to those red cells uh, and remove them uh, from her circulation before you can generate an immune response. So if you think of um, an A uh, positive fetus and an A negative uh, mother, those uh, A cells that are brought in can stay in the circulation for a while as that immune response uh, is generated. However, if you have an A negative mother and a B positive fetus, when those B positive cells are introduced in the circulation, her immune system is going to grab those up and destroy them. So they're not sitting around for that immune response to be generated. Another thing to keep in mind uh, is that this is dose dependent. So it's not just a couple of red cells uh, entering the circulation that's going to cause this. Uh, we typically say you need about one ml of RH positive fetal red cells to generate a response. Now, as I mentioned earlier, RH incompatibility is quite uncommon in higher resource countries because we give prophylactic RH immunoglobulin at 28 weeks gestation and within 72 weeks of delivery if there is uh, RH incompatibility. Now, because RH incompatibility is no longer uh, very common, another thing for you to think about is ABO incompatibility. So let's just talk briefly about different blood types. As you recall, these are all little red cells here. You can be A, B, AB, or O. For uh, individuals who are A, they are making this uh, A protein, uh, or they can make a B protein, 
And then you have AB individuals who make both A and B, so this is codominant. If you are um, O type, then you don't make any of this protein. And this is why O is a universal donor and AB is a universal recipient. Now, with these four options, you would think that um, you would have ABO incompatibility somewhat frequently between mother and fetus. And that actually does occur in about 20 to 25 percent of pregnancies. But only about 5 to 10 percent of these are symptomatic, and they don't tend to be really symptomatic. It tends to be somewhat mild. So only about 0.5 percent of these will require treatment. And the, um, the situation where this is typically going to be when you have A or B infants born to mothers who are type O. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that this incidence that I've just given you will vary depending on population because depending on genetic, genetic ancestry, there are different distributions of A, B, and O uh, blood types. Now, why is ABO incompatibility not such a big deal? Well, one reason is, is that anti-A and anti-B antibodies are typically uh, IgM, and so they don't cross the placenta and cause uh, damage to the fetal red cells. Another reason is that fetal red cells express A and B uh, antigens poorly. So they're not uh, really expressing a lot of uh, these proteins which are going to inoculate uh, the, the mother. And then finally, even if you do have an IgG response to, uh, to the fetus, there are lots of tissues that are expressing A and B, whereas RHD is only going to be on red cells. So lots of uh, different tissues can absorb the transferred antibody, uh, causing some minor damage, but not the specific anemia that we saw. So that is dealing with immune high drops. Now let's focus on non-immune high drops. So as I mentioned earlier, this is caused when you have an imbalance between interstitial fluid production and lymphatic return. Uh, and there are three um, big uh, categories of this. We think of cardiovascular defects, chromosomal anomalies, and anemia. But all of these are really going to come down to hydrostatic pressure and oncotic uh, pressure. So in cardiovascular defects, you can get increased uh, central venous pressure due to um, cardiac failure. Uh, you can get decreased oncotic pressure as, as I mentioned earlier, the liver uh, fails due to hypoxia and is not making albumin. Chromosomal anomalies can result in lymphatic obstructions, and anemias, not the, uh, the, uh, not the immune high drops, but uh, anemias due to a variety of other uh, factors, once more can cause cardiac hypoxia and high output uh, cardiac failure. All right, so let's look here at a list of the different causes of non-immune high drops. Keeping in mind, our two big uh, features here are going to be uh, increased hydrostatic pressure, decreased oncotic pressure. So what, how do these uh, contribute to that? So if you have cardiovascular abnormalities such as uh, an atrioventral um, uh, ventricular septal defect or a hypoplastic uh, left or right heart, that's going to lead to cardiac failure. You can have uh, tachyarrhythmias, which are going to cause, uh, due to rapid beating of the heart, will cause high output cardiac failure leading once more to venous congestion or increased hydrostatic pressure. And you can have bradyarrhythmias, uh, which are going to result in low cardiac uh, output. That's going to cause downstream hypoxia, and that can therefore uh, lead to once more increased hydrostatic pressure. Aneuploidy, uh, classically Turner syndrome, or 45X. Um, most uh, of the pregnancies that have a 45X karyotype do not survive to term. Part of that is due to high drops. Uh, you can also see uh, high drops in trisomy 21 or 18, uh, and this is due to lymphatic obstruction. Anemia can be due to alpha or beta thalassemia or parvovirus uh, B19. So if the mother is infected with uh, parvovirus B19, that's going to infect the fetal red cells and kill them, resulting in uh, an aplastic anemia. A number of infections can lead to non-immune high drops. We don't know uh, necessarily the mechanism for them, but this is something to be aware of. And then you can get twin-to-twin -twin transfusion syndrome and twin gestations. When we think about uh, genital urinary malformations, uh, gastrointestinal malformations, and some tumors, all of these have the mechanism of obstructed uh, venous return. Remember that the, uh, the, the vasculature is going to be um, not as robust or, or thick as we see in, in, a, in an infant or a child or an adult, uh, and so pressure on that uh, is going to, can, can cause obstruction. Fetal tumors can also cause cardiac uh, and liver failure. And then finally, uh, there's a number of metabolic disorders, such as lysosomal storage disorders, that can result in organ damage, such as uh, to the liver and heart.
So I'd like to leave you with three questions so just so you can test to see uh, how much you've uh, retained from the short talk. So why does RH incompatibility result in fetal high drops? Uh, what are the physical findings of fetal high drops and what causes them? And what are the mechanisms uh, of non-immune fetal high drops? All right. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention. I hope you found this useful. Feel free to uh, hit me up on Twitter, uh, send me an email, check out the, uh, the website. Uh, and as always, all of your comments are welcome. Thank you very much.